Hello and welcome to the Tech Doctor Show with Meros and this is the December update with me, your host, Katofi, and I am joined to my right, no, to my right or my left by uh, Kaiba. Kaiba, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. It's been an interesting past month for me personally, but I've been really happy with the work I've been doing on Meros, especially in the past few days. Right. Now, this is the second year anniversary of our podcast. Well, in fact, this is actually the second year and one month anniversary because last month was the second year anniversary, but we didn't realize because we were too busy being awesome. So what I've decided we're going to do is we're going to change up a little bit this um, this month. And instead of having such a deep technical deep dive into the code and whatnot, what we're going to do instead is have a more general overview so we're going to discuss the project what it is how you spent your two years what you've got in plans for the future and just generally those sorts of things so that this podcast can be a starting point for people who are interested in Mero so they don't have to go all the way back to 24 episodes ago which um yeah that's that's hard work right obviously it's good fun listening to us but nobody wants to go through 24 episodes just to get to the meat so Without any further to do, Kaiba, um, what is Meros? Elevator so, pitch, no pressure, but you have to sell it in 45 seconds or less. Go. So Meros is a brand new cryptocurrency. I've been working on it for the ground up for a couple of years now. Haven't done it ICO, haven't gone into any corporate funding. It's truly a passion project of mine. And it aims to take the best parts of existing cryptography and combine them to create an instant, fearless, decentralized, and secure system in just truly an original way. Okay. That was very concise. You've done it in 45 seconds. Take my money. Okay, so we've reached the two-year stage. We've reached the two-year stage of Meros. And, um, well, we've reached the two-year stage of this podcast. How long was Meros in development before we started making this podcast then? I... It's roughly half a year. Uh, I originally posted Meros to my personal GitHub under, the, and the project was just called Currency. Like the repo was just <laughs> Currency, and then the readme just said Currency, a digital instant and feelless currency, <laughs> um, and that That's a good was name. first uploaded back in May. And it was just the it was just, just a readme, and then I just started adding code to it over time. You know, I truly have been public about it since the start, and it was back in. May of 2017? That we start 2018? 2018. It would have been. 2018. Okay, so you started this project in the May. I believe we must have met in the June of that year. I think we met in the June of that year. Yeah. Right, because like we even had the name Ember. Because yes. it was about a month or two past when Currency was uploaded that we got the name Ember before eventually rebranded to Maros. And yeah, it was using the name Ember when we met. So yeah, it would have been a couple months later. Okay, so talk me through it then. Two years have passed. What have you been doing during those two years? What was you mostly doing in year one? What were you mostly doing in year two? And what do you mostly plan on doing in um, year three? So... A lot of it, and I just to be truthful, because that's always something I try to do, I try to be honest and transparent, a lot of it has been me learning. When I started Maros, I very arguably should not have been writing a cryptocurrency. <laughs> There's just a lot of blunders. Like, I, I definitely understood proof of work and how the pieces go together and how to handle signatures and write secure code. I'm not saying I was a total scrub. Um, but when I actually went to implement the difficulty algorithm for the blockchain, because the blockchain was one of the first things I did, I was experimenting with this one idea where instead of updating the difficulty every block, it actually does it every 10 minutes. So if like, you know how with Bitcoin, you can have 40 minute blocks. Mm -hmm. The idea I had in my head was just, well, if 10 minutes pass, we can just lower the difficulty then to make it easier for a block to be found. But that's something that opens up a lot of attack vectors just with timestamp manipulation. And it's not exactly something that I would ship into production without a lot more work. And it's not something that we should have done in Maros. And if you look at Maros today, it doesn't have that. It actually just retargets every block. It's smart about it. 
So I do think that I should have built Maros when I started because I truly believe Maros is a very competent and well-written project now and that those years have been spent learning. So because I've learned, I think it was great that I started when I did. So a lot of it was spent learning, but a lot of it was truly just spent building the system itself. It's a new system. It's not a fork of anything. And because of that, it has a lot of complexities and intricacies. I, we get compared to Nano a lot because they are also instant and feeless. And there's a reason why Maros exists. And to comment on that, Nano has a very concise layout. I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase it. When nodes vote on a transaction, each node locally processes that vote and handles it. There's no global consensus in Maros where every node agrees or no node agrees. Nodes come to their own independent opinion. And this is secure because they still vote, yet there are some attack vectors based off it. And it's one of the reasons I want to create Maros, to create a more firm and secure system. But because of that, in the process of creating a firm and secure system, one of the things we did was add a blockchain and use that for distribution of merit, which is used to vote in order to stop some attacks based that exists with traditional proof of stake systems. But a blockchain cannot be instant and feelless. Sure, you can do four second blocks. There are some projects doing seven second blocks. Ethereum does 14 second blocks. But that's not instant and feelless, no matter how you look at it. That's just close enough, except for the fact that you have to consider you have to get 10 confirms, and then we're talking a couple of minutes. So because of that, we introduced a DAG, and it's something I'm truly happy with. But then on top of it, we need to handle the votes for it, and then those votes have to be archived on the blockchain to enable syncing up the network. And there's just a lot of moving pieces that's part of Meros. And beyond creating these moving pieces, I've been defining the protocol. I've been writing tests for it. I truly would never release a financial system I was not confident in. As much as it's to say, hey, it's crypto, anyone can do it, right? <laughs> anyone can do it. Uh, and that's how a lot of exchanges get hacked. <laughs> um, and that's how a lot of people get mad and lose funds. And some of those people, they're not traders who can afford to lose the few thousand they have on the exchange and who have diversified. Some of those are just average people who saw a project, believed in it, and didn't want to set up a wallet. And every time I hear about these hacks, on the one hand, I kind of get smug about it because I'm like, bad projects, bad project got hacked. Uh, but then I think about how people are suffering loss from this. And it's nice to think of in those circumstances, it's dismissible when you consider all of them as Lambo moon boys who can put this money into a risky investment. But there are average people thrown in there. And because of that, I consider it a moral obligation when working with these systems to truly test and develop them. So beyond defining the protocol and creating an intricate system, there's, I mean, I think 30% of our code on GitHub is just, actually, it may be closer to 50%. I think 30% of our code is just the Python, which is a re-implementation of the protocol. But besides that, we still have tests written in NIM. It, it may be close to like 50% of our code is just tests for the protocol, its intricacies, its edge cases, and truly just making sure that we have compliant software. Okay, so so that was those were the things you were focusing on in in year one, or is that an overview of the the two years? Uh, I think because... year one had a lot of learning, and it really started to shape up one and a half years to two years in. I had laid a lot of the bare bones. I had done some reforms to the protocol, but I think it was one and a half years, and when I actually wrote down the protocol. It was something yeah. that I meant to do. It's just something I'd been putting off. And I did it because the protocol had gone in too complex to just keep in my head. There are a lot of edge cases and I really needed to reference things. And it's hard to reference things when there's no firm thing to reference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And when yeah. I did that, I saw how, the edge, how all the pieces fit together and I was able to review it in tightening gaps. And since then, don't get me wrong, the protocol's still been changed. But that's when it really started to form up and when the larger reforms ended. We did edit how transactions were handled a good bit, but that was really when it started to firm up. So it's been the past year that I've really been focusing on implementing the protocol as it is and properly testing it and ensuring it's ready. And now we have a code base that implements a large majority of this protocol. It's tested. Our test nets have proved that yes, there are bugs and we can work through them, but it is mostly stable. And I was actually talking with a friend the other day, and I'm like, 
I could probably just launch Maros if I wanted to. It'd be a horrible idea, don't get me wrong, before someone says, let me fork Maros and front run this. No, don't, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> but it probably is functional and working enough that it would meet the expectations for cryptocurrency projects. So, so, so that said, so the expectations so for cryptocurrency projects are just extremely low, and I don't want to be that person who plays to the minimum for money. Maros will launch when it's ready, and we so, are still... So you are saying that Meros is currently ready to launch. So we're at a stage now where we could release it tomorrow. So long as we're fine with it maybe not working. Maybe crashing. Uh, maybe someone attacking the network and manipulating it. Maybe a few funds would be lost. Okay. <laughs> no, okay. It, it isn't ready to be launched. But it's definitely <laughs> promising enough where I would say it meets the minimum expectations for cryptocurrency projects. Especially if we look at the current state of DeFi on Ethereum. If we consider DeFi as the bare minimum, yes, we're already past that. But okay. This project isn't about hitting the minimum. It's about building a quality project, which will last for years to come and truly be something people can look at, not only as quality, but as I hope moral, something that can be trusted and respected. Yeah. Okay. So when you started off on this journey, did you envision that it would take you two years to complete? How long did you think Meros was going to take? I did not expect that we would be two and a half years in at this point. I was expecting for it to take a year and a half, I thought. I know about a year ago, I was initially thinking, yeah, this is probably close to launch. <laughs> and it hit that period called the eternal three months, which is something we talked about on past yeah. podcast. Yeah. But the thing is, is that there's this one thing we did and it just truly wasn't functional. And if we launched with it, we were going to have to remove it six months later. But if we remove it six months later, we're going to have both systems because you'll need system A to sync and verify the network, but then you'll need system B for the modern network. And this makes a lot of sense for coins like Monero, which constantly evolve their privacy. And I in no way mean to attack that or degrade that, and I truly respect how Monero handles it. That said, when you're not talking about Monero updating their privacy, but complete reforms to the databases, to how transactions are handled, it's really not something you want to hard for because eventually you create a whole new network protocol. And if you're going to do that, it really becomes a bad job when you're continuously patching the original code base. Okay, so Meros is a, a, pro, a, a cryptocurrency. So the idea is that it's supposed to be one of those things uh, with the old cliche, I can use it to buy a cup of coffee because it's fast right. and it's fearless, et cetera, et cetera. Now, a lot of other projects do claim that they can do this. One of them is uh, Nano, and that is the one that Meros gets compared to the most at the moment. <laughs> I guess as time goes on, there'll be other cryptos which will hit the heights if Meros doesn't beat them to it, which Meros will get compared to. So how does Meros differ from something like a Nano? So as I brought up before, we have a different consensus mechanism. Well, Nano has voting. And at one point, there's this concept. Well, let me start by saying, well, they have voting. Nodes on their own look at how people are voting and nodes on their own decide how it ended up going. And this can still be used as a secure system, yet there are attack vectors where you can say, oh, what if we sent node A this set of votes and then node B this set of votes? And can we try to manipulate that to cause some nodes to think X and some nodes to think Y. And this will get resolved and it's ex almost, it can be made effectively impossible to do as long as one node is always connected to an honest node. If it's connected to an honest node, it should receive any votes, any vote updates, any corrections. And because of that, it should never enter the scenario. That said, <laughs> it, I personally feel like it was playing the odds a bit much and not actually creating a secure system but creating a mostly secure system that would be effectively impossible to attack. But there's enough to raise concerns, especially when you consider code isn't perfect. So because of that, we have a different vote process. You don't delegate Nano. I think right now it's three parties on Nano that have a 51% majority. It may be five, but it is a few. It's kind of similar to Bitcoin pools. Because while they have a over 100 people, 
who have at least 0.1%, and that's definitely significant. It is the top representatives who have the most. And this is my common criticism of delegation. It's even if you don't have a whale singularly staking all their coins, the second you add delegation, it becomes a marketing campaign. Whoever markets the best is going to get the most delegation. And because of that, people who otherwise wouldn't stake are now going to be contribute to the power of a few people who, if they decide to turn malicious, are suddenly a lot more dangerous because they no longer have to buy 30% of nano they can, or whatever coin we're discussing. They can just get delegated 30% via marketing and so on. Yeah. So with Maros, we really did go for global consensus and firm effective guarantees. And of course, Maros has its own attack vectors and that's not something I'm going to deny. We're still vulnerable to the classic 51% attack. But we try to add a lot of more firm, firm securities and precautions. For example, before a transaction finalizes on Maros, we actually use an 80% threshold instead of 50%. And this isn't part of the protocol. This is an implementation detail. But if it detects any competing transactions, two people, like someone trying to create a double spend or something that risks becoming a double spend, it will actually refuse to verify it for an extended period of time with the idea that if you're putting the network at risk, you don't deserve instant transactions. And of course, this is going to have the edge case where someone will make a mistake, and that is unfortunate. But I do believe that prioritizing security is the way to go. And beyond that, we aim to add features and functionality that enable us to go further. Because while both Nano and Maros primarily aim to be a currency, like neither of us are adding smart contracts, and the lead of Nano, uh, Colin LeMayhu, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his last name, right? Um, he has explicitly said he don't believe smart contracts would benefit Nano, and I agree with him. I don't think smart contracts would benefit Maros, and I don't want anyone to start chilling that. That said, I do believe there is some functionality that currencies do need, such as atomic swaps. And we wrote ASMR a while ago to implement atomic swaps from Maros, and we also had Nano support added. My The person I worked with on, on it, as a partner was Plasma Power. And while we initially supported Maros, he added Nano support and I added Monero support. I fully support collaboration and I can't say it's a feature limited to Maros, but not Nano. That said, before the new protocol was announced and we built ASMR, I was planning on adding special support to Maros for atomic swaps to compensate for that. And Colin is of the mindset that you just shouldn't add that functionality even though atomic swaps are valuable. He, valuable, sorry. He really wants to keep the protocol concise and focus on being a currency. Well, I have a more expanded definition of what will make a currency thrive. Yes. We also support storing small bits of data on the network. I'm not trying to claim or file coin, see a whatever project you want to talk about or IPFS, but we do support storing up to 256 uh, bytes at a time on the network. And this is extremely helpful because now you can store like hashes on the network. You can theoretically store small programs if you wanted to build a smart contract layer on top of Maros. It wouldn't be capable of locking Maros into it, which is a key distinction, but it would be capable of a token protocol or an NFT protocol, which I know is something you're excited about, even if it's not something I personally want to add. <laughs> but that said, despite having that, which enables flexibility for Maros as a platform and enables us gathering adoption, which would lead to adoption of it as a currency, we have a spam filter and we have one for transactions. So you can't spam the network with transactions, but we also have one, a separate one for data. So if data is overwhelming the network and stopping its core principle of being a currency, we can actually limit the amount of data published to enable Maros to primarily be a currency. And we can balance it out to always prioritize transfer value, which is the purpose of Maros. So for the end user, um, thinking about Meros now and hopefully when it does reach mainnet we'll find out more details about that from you later but will how will the the regular user be able to use Meros will I be able to store it on my mobile phone will I be able to to use it to buy things over the internet how exactly will the average end user interact with Meros so Right now, we're truly focusing on the node software. And I have to say, integrating a node software in a wallet is generally really not a good idea. As much as it's great to be able to download a node and it just has a wallet and you fully validate the chain, there's 
really two different things. You know, you expect a wallet not only to manage your private keys and to know about what transactions are relevant to you, but you also expect it to provide a GUI and certain configuration options that Node doesn't care about. And when you combine these two pieces of software, you gain an advantage. Not only do you gain the security and the ease because the systems can just directly talk to each other, but it means that any end user who downloads Maros and they're just like, oh yeah, I want to try this out, they also instantly start running a Node. There, I'm not saying it becomes a server and it suddenly lets people connect to their computer. No, Maros runs where you can just be a client. You can connect to other nodes and that will still allow you to act as a relay between two nodes that have their servers available, whether it be a person at their home who's work forwarding or a virtual private server or whatever. So that's the main reason we integrated the wallet, not because we not be, or because I actually thought it was better from a code perspective or from a design perspective, but to ensure that people who get started with the network as a start are contributing and helping it grow. But in the future, the end user is truly going to go for light wallets. And that's not something deniable. As soon as someone builds a light wallet, it instantly is going to reduce chain space. It's going to reduce processes and power. It's going to increase accessibility. I don't know any cryptocurrency that you should run as a node on your phone at this point in time. So a secure light wallet, like an SPV wallet, is something I definitely want to get going. And Maros does specifically support that on the protocol level. So because of that, I do plan for not only an SPV desktop wallet, but for a mobile wallet. But it's not something I've at all prioritized development efforts on just because it's a large undertaking. And I personally feel there are higher priorities at hand. Okay. Okay. So that said, our community has expressed interest. In fact, just a couple of days ago, someone asked, hey, are we going to have a mobile wallet? And it's definitely something I consider critical for adoption. But beyond that, one of our community members, this was actually months ago, they actually created a design online where you could browse it and you know click through it and see what it was like. And I actually really liked it as a design for a mobile wallet. It's just uh, no one stepped up to make an app out of it. And that's not like, oh, I don't like these people. No, uh, it would be a large <laughs> undertaking. The protocol was changing. They would have had to update it. Maros was not mature enough for a mobile wallet to be developed without just adding a lot more work than was necessary. But it's definitely something I want to focus on once we launch. Okay, so what I, what I want to do briefly is I want to kind of break that down for people who are maybe not as tech savvy. First of all, congratulations making it in 20 minutes if you are not that tech savvy but for some of the listeners or, or watchers they may not have understood the the small differences that are between node software and wallet software so if you could just break it down for us into layman's terms what are the differences between node software and wallet software what does and what does node software actually do so Node software is the backbone of the network. It stores the blockchain, it stores transactions, it stores both, and it makes sure that they're all valid, you know? But then if someone goes to broadcast a transaction, it tracks that and it sends it to everyone else. Whereas a wallet goes to send a transaction, it generally sends it to a single node. Right. A wallet is not going to be interested in storing the entire database with every transaction. No, it's going to be interested in storing the transactions relevant to it, which means the one it has sent and the ones which have been sent to it. And it's not going to be interested in validating every other transaction or learning of other transactions and spending bandwidth to send them across to each other. So nodes act as the backbone of the network. And the incentive to run one is the same as Bitcoin. It's to provide stability, or if you run a wallet and want to increase your security and ensure access, you can run a node yourself and the wallet can directly connect and you can ensure you always have access to the network. Uh, Ethereum, with its popular browser extension such as MetaMask, it uses Infura as a backend so anyone can publish transactions and makes it very accessible. And it's a free service and it's one of support. That said, a couple of weeks ago, it actually went offline and it broke almost every dApp uh, on the internet just because MetaMask no, suddenly no longer worked. And it actually, I think it also caused the chain split. I think some people were using Infura to um, keep chains connected to each other, like to ensure that it wasn't on a fork or it wasn't mining against the rest of miners. And I think there actually was a, a couple hours of blocks that diverged. 
It may have only been a few minutes, but an inferno was down for a few hours, but it actually caused network problems because of this centralized service. And while I support it as a whole, it shows the risk of putting all your eggs in one basket. So if you have a wallet and you want to be conscious, if you want to make sure you're not getting fed faulty data, you would be interested in running a node. If you're an exchange or a payment processor, you would be interested in running a node. If There's a lot of reasons to do it. And again, if you want to get a wallet at the start, you're going to be running a node. And that's just truly to ensure network stability. And I'm not really concerned about the disk space or bandwidth behind it just because Maros is just going to have started and it's not going to be... a uh, like we're spending gigabytes and hours downloading the chain. No, it's going to take a few minutes to download at the start. Okay, so the next step in, I guess. So we've got the actual, the 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 real newcomers, and then we've got the kind of savvy miner types, guys that will, or guys and, and women that will mine mm -hmm. the currency and want to um, contribute in that sense. Now, is Meros a currency that can be mined? And if so, when can somebody start mining and how how much of a reward will they get for mining? What is what is the process behind mining like for somebody who's interested in Meros? So um, Meros is definitely mineable. It's the only way that you're going... Well, technically, it's not the only way. We've talked about this before, but we have set up the Meros Development Fund. And actually... Like months ago, we are actually planning on doing a free mine. That said, not only was a free mine not decentralized, which is something I'm a huge proponent of, decentralization, but it had the issue in that it was only meant to last for a few years, and it was time-locked. It's not like I suddenly just got millions of marrows that I could run away with at any time. No, it was time-locked, and if the community decided I wasn't worthy, they could have hard forked it out. But... What we ended up going with was the Maros Development Fund, which was a decentralized process where the users can actually vote on people they believe have contributed to Maros and are worthy of them. So that is one way to earn Maros, and that's a whole separate discussion for another time. We've talked about it before in the past, of course, but for anyone who maybe, isn't going back through all our episodes. Maybe we'll touch on it a little bit later on. But yeah, sure. the main thing I re but really... But if you're not going to, to be doing that, you're going to be yeah. mining. And yeah. mining alone doesn't earn Maros... Technically, so arguably you don't get Maros through mining, but effectively, when you mine when you mine the Maros blockchain, you earn a token called Merit. It's non-transferable. It's if I mean you could transfer it, but you would use your private key, and there's no guarantee that that private key hasn't been sold to multiple parties. And the second multiple people start using it, it it, it is going to uh, endorse some sort of double spend, just because anyone who creates two transactions, one person with the private key is going to see one, one's going to see another. And because of that, as soon as it happens, that merit holder is going to be disqualified. So there's really no way to transfer this unless you completely trust that the other person is not going to transfer it again and isn't going to keep continue using it on a personal level. So as we, so there's this non-transferable token that's mined and that's truly just to ensure distribution. We use a CPU mining algorithm. It's really meant so you don't have to buy any specialized hardware. And of course it is a competition. People with higher end hardware, gaming computers are going to be advantaged and that's just a fact of life. But it is meant to be as decentralized as possible. So because of that, when you mine Merit, you can then start voting on transactions. And this voting is what actually earns you Maros when you contribute to network security, when you start validating transactions and enabling them to be instantly handled, this is what earns you Maros. So okay. that means any miner will actually have to run a node in order to vote on transactions in real time. Okay, so on a practical level, you spoke about voting. Does that mean that I'm going to have to be sitting at my desk and voting on transactions like uh, some kind of data entry clerk? Well, okay, that looks, that looks legit. <laughs> no, that it's a completely legit. automatic process. You run a node. If it sees a transaction and it's like, oh, yeah, this is the first transaction spending these funds. I'll vote on it. It votes on it. But if it suddenly sees the second transaction, it's like, wait, no, hold on. I, I, I voted for this transaction to get these funds, this one, not this one. And I'm not going to vote on you. I'm going to log you and say that I should not, internally, I should not consider these transactions confirmed. I should wait for an extended period of time to ensure resolution properly and securely. But I'm not going to create a vote that could confuse some, confuse some nodes and think that both transactions have a claim at being valid. So, so, because when a node votes on multiple transactions, it risks one node thinking transaction A is valid and another considering transaction B as valid. 
So from so from a miner's point of view, all I would have to do is download the software uh, and run it on a reasonably powerful computer. The more powerful the computer, mm -hmm. the actual CPU, the more um, well, what would be automatically to me, the more more meros I would earn. So I would be getting yeah. merit, and then my node would automatically be mm -hmm. voting on things with that merit and turning it into meros, and then with that meros, I can then go and spend. As another interesting aspect, which actually really incentivizes early adopter, when you mine merit, it doesn't just last for like 10 minutes, which is the block time, because blocks are, blocks don't confirm transactions, folks do, so we can securely have a block time that's 10 minutes without ruining the fact we're instant. Um, but, they, but merit doesn't last 10 minutes, it's not some very quick thing. But if you stop mining, you can actually continue running a node and continue validating transactions for an entire year. So because of that, sorry, I just had to stretch. I've been sitting here a while. Um, because of that, you can actually continue running your node even if you're not getting blocks and you don't want to spend, you know, energy just mining a trans mining a blockchain that you have no feasible chance of winning. And you can continue your node running for the next year. And of course, this does raise a concern where if someone's mining for the first three months and then they're like, okay, I'm done. Then we want to stop mining. I want to stop voting. Does that just mean like three months of merit is gone and because of that, it's not going to reach 80% because that's 25% of the year's merit? No, we have a system where if merit stops being used, it's removed from the eligible pool and it can't just suddenly become reactive and skew the voting weight. No, it, it becoming active takes uh, a couple hours for all existing transactions to be cleared, finalized and guaranteed. Okay, so this would possibly be a good time for me to round it up because what I'm trying to do this this episode is I'm trying to keep things as simple as possible. So could I round it up and say the way that Meros works is that there is a blockchain under uh, there is a blockchain and you use this blockchain to mine something called Merit. Now, once you've got Merit and your node is still running, you can now instantly or as near as to instant as you mm -hmm. possibly can get you can now instantly um process transactions uh, on other people's behalf so someone could put something through and because there's all these nodes connected they could instantly say yes or mm -hmm. no as it as it happens and you don't have to wait for another block um for the transactions to go in because you're now using the transaction layer is like a dag and the mm -hmm. the you're right okay and the so, votes are what actually matter here in voting, which is an automatic process, is what will earn you merits. Okay, so I, I just hope that that makes things simpler for people who are not quite as tech savvy mm -hmm. as you. Because it uh, did. I do appreciate your summaries because I know I tend to go very in depth and go off on a couple tangents. So I really do appreciate your summaries for making this more accessible. Yes, thank you. Because uh, yeah, for me, I, 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 to be honest, I think we were doing these podcasts for maybe four or five months before I was like, okay, now I really get it. It really does take a while. And then when you start throwing in the fact that you're using a sp special algorithm and then you start talking about signatures and then you just do this kyber magic, all of a sudden everybody gets confused. So I just wanted yep. to keep things mm -hmm. nice and uh, nice and simple so that this can be, like I said before, a, 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 sure. a starting place. Okay, so my next question is... Okay, this is a good question, actually. Uh, what I'm doing now is I'm going through questions that we've had um, in the Discord two things I wanted to explain before we go any further. First of all, this banner behind me is obviously a PIVX banner. The reason why I've got this banner up is because I'm actually in my office and I want to keep my office location in secret. So I've put this banner up. PIVX is no way uh, invo involved with Meros, obviously, as um, PIVX is a completely separate project. So that's the reason why that's there. Which Secondly, we both have our own opinions on, which we may or may not frequently disagree and get into heated debates about. <laughs> yes, basically, yes. <laughs> okay. But luckily, soon, Kayaba will have his own project so that I can slate Meros. And I will. I will. Flame Wars are incoming. So the second thing, um, I forgot what the second thing is. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and read the questions. So, uh, Meros also has a Discord. Um, I'll put the link in the description. It's always in the description. But you can join the Meros Discord and you can um, discuss with me, uh, Kayaba, some of the other people who have contributed towards Meros. Oh, my other phone's ringing. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, so, so, so... That aside, what people have done is they've gone into the Discord and they've put forward these questions. Now, 
I'm going to read some of these questions out because over the years, we've had some pretty good questions, right? But this one comes up quite frequently. And the question is, how many transactions per second will Meros be capable of at launch? Now, we've discussed this before. So what I also want to ask you is, how will you increase this number and when will this number increase? So, sure. And this is an answer that's not going to win me any popularity contest for a few reasons. The first one being, I don't know. It's really not a metric I've considered over time. Because, well, it is great to always grab a super powerful computer and be like, oh, this is doing hundreds of transactions per second, best cryptocurrency. It's not reflective at all of what's going to happen, and it's very misleading. Until you actually get a network up and running, until you actually run a test against it to see how well it performs, you're really just being misleading because network conditions are a huge factor in how many transactions you can do. As you become more decentralized, that means more people voting and more people voting means more votes to handle and that is going to slow things down. That said, there are definitely a lot of optimizations we can make in the future. One of the things we do is we use BLS signatures for voting, which is a very complicated thing, but it means that you can have say the top 10 uh, mayor holders get together and they can actually produce a single vote for all 10 of them. So that means if you want to handle their vote, you can just personally handle all 10 votes at once. And this is a massive optimization that will, will eventually lead to us being able to do one vote per transaction. And that can represent tens to hundreds of mayor holders and anyone can insert themselves into the process. And it's actually something I'm extremely excited about. That said, it does require a bit more coordination than currently going around. So at launch, it's not going to be a feature we have enabled despite having the backbone, the cryptography, and the protocol theoretical support for it. Um, and by theoretical support, I just mean the protocol is designed with that in mind. It's not going to be like we can just one month in release a software update. No, it is going to be a hard fork when it finally comes around. Um, or technically, actually, we could do it without it being a hard fork, but everyone should upgrade anyway, so we might as well make it one. <laughs> Because one of the things I want to do is upgrade Meros frequently. Tech is constantly evolving. If we don't evolve with it, we're going to fall behind and be stagnant. And that's really not what I want for this project after this many years of development. That's a good question, all right? Um, my, uh, my next question will be, um, I'm going to come back to the uh, issue, the, the last question I just asked you. I'm going to come back to that one because I'm not, not really satisfied with the answer that you just gave me. Uh, hard forks. Now, with a new technology or a new project like Meros, there are chances that um, there's going to be hard forks every, I don't know, maybe let's say as frequently as six months, every six months, let's say. Obviously, you're not going to know now. Um, how do you plan on keeping people up to date with these hard forks? So if somebody's interested in investing in Meros and, and contributing at the beginning, how are they going to know where to f find out the information? How are they going to know to get the alerts that there is a hard fork incoming? Where, where will all the news be? So our Discord is always our primary source of information. I try to be very involved, engaged, and active within our community to make sure everyone is on the same page. Beyond that, we post updates on Twitter. And what I've seen some projects do is, subs is have a mailing list so anyone can subscribe to get an email. And that's something I appreciate. There are some other solutions. Bitcoin had an emergency alert system at one point. It was never used, and only a few people were allowed to use it, as in there was a signature check behind it. And one of the developers who had the key that met, that was part of it, I believe the French police raided his house for some financial reason. I don't remember. Like, I don't mean to slander this guy. I'm not sure if he was, like, some... BS crypto charge about taxes, some actual tax charge. I don't know what was going on. But I do know that at one point, the French police went into his house. And because of that, the French, it may not be the French government. It was French, Italian, Spanish. I, I, I understand. I should remember the difference here. They are very <laughs> different people. I am pretty sure it's oh. France, but I could be wrong. I'm, I'm not the best historian for Bitcoin. Um, but because of that, the, if it is the French, then the French government has access to it. <laughs> and the French government could create a Bitcoin emergency alert system through the nodes at any time. So it was removed from the software. No one's actively using that. <laughs> like the, the system is like, okay, we tried this. We never used it. And now the French government has access. We're going to back off. 
But then even if we look at Electrum, Electrum had an alert system. Um, if you connect it to an Electrum server, they could say, hey, you know, there's an update available. It's a new Bitcoin software, blah, blah, blah. So then someone sent off a bunch of Electrum nodes and sent fake alerts with fake download links. And this caused a lot of people to get scammed because suddenly they were downloading unofficial Electrum versions because their own wallet told them there was an update available to go to this link and download it. And it was this huge problem. And the answer, it, it just ends up where these decentralized alert systems, they always have problems. And even if you manage to send an alert to a node, if the, if the node's running on a server, you know, it's not a wallet where someone's logging in and doing transactions, that alert isn't guaranteed to be handled or checked. So there's really just no good way to handle these alerts besides platforms such as Discord, email, Twitter. And then of course our GitHub is where all development happens and release, and there's going to be updates to the readme, there's going to be issues, there's going to be new releases on the code base because GitHub allows us to say version 1.0, version 1.1, 2, so on. Okay, right, going back now, because I'm not gonna let you wriggle out. You kind of wriggled out, you gave me a politician's answer when we spoke about how many transactions per second will Meros have at launch. Now, I. I am going to push you this on this one because I want to know a ballpark figure. Where 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 are you anticipating? Because obviously at this point it is it is a um, a speculation. But where are you anticipating Meros to land? And as you said, there were different factors. Are there any factors that people can help? So is there any way that someone like me or another person who's interested in getting involved can help speed up the network? Um, yeah, those two questions, but I need a ballpark figure this time. So, uh, so this goes back to the other reasons that people always be mad at me. I would personally be happy if the network hit seven transactions per second. And that sounds horribly low. It's not the expected answer. Oh, if your network can't do a thousand TPS and it's marketing claims. But the reason I would be happy with that is because that sets a baseline of Bitcoin. And of course, Bitcoin has had SegWit and there's been a lot of changes and I'm not trying to disparage Bitcoin here. Lightning network, but seven transactions per second is a number that Bitcoin is known for. And I think with SegWit, it does get up to 14, but not everyone's using SegWit. I think it's still like 48% of transactions. So because of that, it's like at 10 transactions per second now because users aren't opting into these faster methods. I'm not sure how it plays with Lightning as well. But if we go back to that number of seven transactions per second, if we can set a baseline of better than Bitcoin, even though that would be nowhere near where we would need to be to be a currency, that would personally make me happy because there's a lot of optimizations we can do from just making the node faster, you know, going back in the code, seeing where it's slow, just checking in on it to changing how we send messages to each other. You know, I might send a message to node A, B, and C, but if there's a way to see that as in S-E-E, -E, not the letter C. If there's a way to see that node B already caught a message, we don't have to bother sending it back to it. So there's a lot of safeties we can do there just to have more efficient communication. And then as I was talking, we can get it down to one vote tra per transaction. And if we get it down to one vote per transaction, that is going to be a massive speed up because now instead of doing 10 votes, we're going to be doing one vote and that's a 10% that's going to only take 10% of the time. So if we can set a baseline, I would be happy with that. And I'm going to compare to Nano, which isn't something I generally like to do. But I believe that there are beta net, which is a, not, it's not the main net, it's where they do their testing. And there, it's not representative to the main net either. There's a lot fewer nodes. And because of that communication is just more limited. And because of that, it's smaller and faster. Yeah. That said, their beta net, I think it recently hit, I think it was... I personally thought it was over a thousand transactions per second, but someone told me that it was 2000, which is something immensely impressive. But if we look at the live network, we're still doing, I think the peak was 160. And I think that was transactions confirmed per second. And if you want to send a uh, nano to someone, you not only have to have the send transaction, but you have to receive it. You have to explicitly receive it. So because of that, they vote on twice as many things because each transfer of money has two parts to it. Whereas Maris just uses the single. So because of that, if we look at 80 transactions confirmed per second, not 160 confirmations per second, and I could be wrong about these numbers. I may be, I may be off somewhere, and in that case, please correct me. I'm not trying to spread misinformation. But I think it was at 80 transactions per confirmed per second on the mainnet. And I think that that shows that 
yeah, you can have a marketing claim of 2000 and you can set up a network where it is 2000 or even 1000, which would be a better ratio. But in reality, your actual network is going to be doing a fraction of that just because it really comes down to how the network itself is and how many nodes are running and how many people are voting. And then beyond that, if we look at the network itself, um, a lot of people are running hardware on like Raspberry Pis or cheaper servers, whereas people who are enthusiasts and trying to participate in the beta net will have faster hardware. So there's just a lot of things to consider. But I think it does say that if you look at Nano, I think in the past, yeah, it was probably doing five to 10 TV transactions per second. I think when I got in in 2017, it was doing around 20. Uh, and I think that can show that you can definitely improve a network as it goes along and a low initial TPS is nothing to laugh at. Sure, it says that it's not ready for adoption on day one, but what is? <laughs> yeah. Okay, and if you right. want a firm estimate, I will tell you at least one. <laughs> there you go. Politicians answer. But... So I, nice. I know there's a few that's... things I said that, that people aren't going to be happy of, but it's all the truth. Yeah, well... Um... That's fair enough. I guess it's similar to when you buy um, the internet, you get broadband here in the UK. They'll tell you, oh, we get broadband and you get 15 megabits per second. And then you go to do a streaming test and it tells you that you're getting two megabits. So I guess it's one thing to claim these kinds of speeds in optimal mm -hmm. conditions. But I personally would prefer that um, that we have the truth and, and I know exactly what the network's actually going to be like. So... Um, yeah, this is the kind of transparency that you're becoming well known for. So yeah, thank, thank you. you for that. Okay. Um, next question. Next question is, uh, I guess we kind of covered this one. I guess we kind of covered this one, but um, how can someone get hold of Meros? I'll tell you so, what, I can, I can expand on that question, in fact. So... When Meros goes to mainnet, um, what do you have any plans for people to get hold of Meros outside of being able to mine it? Say somebody doesn't have um, a computer at home where they can mine, mm -hmm. or maybe they're just mobile and they've got uh, their Xbox or something oh. like that. Is there if they're <laughs> mobile, then there's the question of how they're going to get a wallet going. But to yeah, do sure. a Comment, let, let's say a basic starter laptop, it runs Windows, it has a couple gigabytes of RAM. You really should not be mining on this thing. It's a few <laughs> years old, it has a dual core. Like yep. there, there's definitely laptops out there that you wouldn't be able to mine on. And the node itself and therefore the wallet will still run on these. And that's very important to me to have accessibility. Um, How would someone there, like that get hold of Meros? Are a lot of community members that if I have the opportunity, I definitely want to give Meros to. Um, the Maris Development Fund, which is what I brought up before, which is the other way that Maris is created, the first round kicks in after a month. So for the very first month of the network, people get to vote, and then a month in, it starts distributing and over time rewarding contributors. So not only could you, for your podcast, sign up to receive part of this, but I want to use... Um, I mean, to, I'm not going to lie, sugarcoat this claim. Oh, yeah, we have 20 top developers. I have been the developer behind Maros. Going to try to keep my ego in check here. Um, yeah, but I have time. been the primary developer, and I've been the only developer to go full-time on this at any point. And we've definitely had some part-time contributors, and we've had contractors. And there's people who haven't been writing code but have been working on the project. They've been giving advice. There's you who's really been helping with creating a personable presence and reach out to people and communicate. And you're definitely something, someone I'm thankful for and someone I appreciate and a major contributor to Maros, even if you've never written a single line of code. Just say um, it with money, mate. Just say it with money. We'll be happy. Um, so because there are a lot of people like that. There are people who have contributed, people who have been here for a while. There are people who managed to set up a node, even if they didn't mind, they participated in the test nets. And there's definitely people I want to report. I don't have a pre mine. I can't guarantee anything. I'm not going to be able to <laughs> drop $10,000 in cash and do it and give it away. And we're also not the type of project that's going to do an airdrop, not only because we don't have a pre mine, but airdrops really just encourage short sales. You know, people are going to get it and they're going to be like, oh, free money. And a lot of people are, as they send it to an exchange, are going to realize it's powerful, but they'd rather just buy some ether and contribute to a DeFi project in the short term. And there's problems with that. So we're not the type of project that are socially or economically interested in that. But besides me personally wanting to reward people who have been here for a while and contributed, the resources are just going to be the standard option. You can buy Maros. And if you have a 
cheaper laptop. I honestly feel like it's insulting for me to say that. One of the things I try to be very conscious of is how wealth affects different people. If you're in a third world country, a lot of people have phones. Some of them are using Bitcoin or Ethereum to get around due to local currency issues. Venezuela is a notable example when it comes to Bitcoin. I think there was this pizza place, like this major pizza place. I want to say Papa John's, but I'm not sure that they started accepting Bitcoin at every store that they had opened in Venezuela. And I think there's also some McDonald's internationally that have also started accepting cryptocurrency because of problems with their legal tender there. Yeah. And of course, that is the problems where now you're paying a couple of dollars to order food or just do daily tasks. And there's problems with accepting it and concerns about security. But beyond that, if these people can't trust their local currency, how can they? There's concerns with being able to afford a couple USD every time they go to buy something or make a transaction. And that's something, one of the re main reasons I wanted Miros to be fearless because anyone can spend a few seconds, like even with a very high spam limit, anyone can spend a few seconds saying, hey, this isn't spam, or I'd like you to handle my transaction. But paying a couple of dollars is inaccessible to a lot of people. So if you're having one of those lower powered laptops, which means you can't exactly drop a few hundred on newer hardware, which is a situation even a lot of people in first world countries are in, whether they're living paycheck to paycheck, I do really feel kind of rude and like I'm not taking consideration into their scenario when I say you can buy Maros. But it is the truth. If you want to participate in a currency, you're going to have to either work for it. As I said, you, the Maros Development Fund is open to anyone. If you're doing social media presence, if you want to create local events, anyone can sign up for this. But I'm not going to claim that we're creating universal basic income or solving global poverty. Poverty. Okay, so let's let's talk about that more because um, this this Meros Development Fund, I think it's a, a brilliant idea. Whoever it was that kind of nudged you in that direction probably deserves a medal. Um, how I actually how... have to say, you were not the contributing factor behind that. You were not. You were a contributing factor, but you weren't the biggest one. It was actually, I think it was a community member of ours named Pedro, who was actually the one who created the issue on GitHub and kind of really got me to discuss this. And because of that, I know you have chilled DAOs for a long time. And I've actually said it before in the Maros Discord, I would never want to add a DAO to it. And of course, here we are now, where I, I, I don't generally call it a DAO, but I'm not going to be an idiot and say it isn't a DAO. Uh, but there are a lot of changes from the traditional model seen at Dash due to the timing of it and the way rewards are distributed in the voting process. You know, we don't have master nodes. There's definitely a lot of different functionality behind well, it. I tell you what, let's talk about... Um... Uh, about the funding so what exactly does the DAO, DAO do what does it change and how is it different from say having a pre-mine which is something that uh, a lot of other projects have had so of course when we talk about the first month i do expect just because of my representation and being considered the project lead that i am going to get the large majority of the initial of the initial uh issuance from the development fund but I also fully expect you would actually be a bit disappointed in you if you didn't also create a funding quest. And I'd be disappointed in the community if you weren't recognized for your contributions and you didn't also get funds from that. And because of that... Because... Can, I, can I stop you there, though? Can I stop you? Is there a way sure. that you can um, ensure that this happens? Or could a bunch of other people mine when the network goes live, because you're not going to be the only miner, uh, me and a couple of my pals mm -hmm. might decide to mine, and then when the requests go in, you may not get the lion's share of the fund. Like, it's just, it's literally not in your hands at this point. Oh, no, there's definitely a risk where malicious actors could do it. But I the thing call is... That malicious. <laughs> it's not malicious if I do it. If I do it, it's fine. It's malicious if somebody wants well, to if you mean them. no, 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 I, I know I understand if people think that your contributions are greater and they contribute to them. I don't think that's malicious. I think that's the community voting, and I think that's democracy in action. Of course, we're not doing KYC. We're not getting IDs and saying, <laughs> "Oh yeah, you're a legitimate human." It's one Maros, one vote, and it's not even one Maros. You can have a fraction of Maros and get a vote because our votes are done in the smallest unit of Maros. We aren't being exclusionary like that. If Maros costs a hundred dollars at one point, I'm not saying it will. I'm not saying anything about price. I'm just saying if it is no. valued that high yeah. you're not going to need a hundred dollars to vote you can vote with a penny as long as you have a penny worth of maris and that's something i want to do for accessibility you're not going to have to lock in ten thousand maros or have it for months at a time you can have liquid funds you can be someone who 
isn't able to store thousands at a time, but you will still be able to vote. And there might be some miners who want to vote from themselves. They say, hey, I want free money. That said, the funds the Maros Development Fund creates, it's a fraction. I, I think it ends up as 4.8% of the total supply. And that's definitely noticeable. And that will definitely encourage development. There's a reason it is as it is. But I hope miners will be able to realize in the community, because it's not miners that get to vote. It's whoever holds Maros. And of course, while well, miners are the one who vote on transactions and earn marrow, so I'm not trying to deny that at all, they are going to sell it for actual profit in other currencies. And when they do that, other people are going to buy it. And there are going to be exchange wallets which hold it, which is a concern I have when it comes to the development fund, but that is for a different time. Mm -hmm. And I hope they realize that the fraction of the 4.8% of the pie, they could, uh, the total supply that they could steal from the selves. So like, yes, they could use their funds to get a slice of the pie. But I hope they realize that even if they manage to get 1% of the total supply, the value created by funding development will exceed that thanks to their holdings. Yeah, Because they have I, to have significant holdings to weight it to the point that they can slice that pie without external what, help. What I, was, what I was really thinking was not not really so, so, so much along the lines of an attack, but more along the lines of um, a, a mutiny uh, of sorts. So effectively, if somebody else comes along and they and they decide, um, maybe they might say that they're going to build the light wallet or they're going to build the, the mobile wallet. Mm -hmm. And you may feel like you don't like it. You personally don't have veto power. There's nothing in the code base which I, says that you can veto something. Uh, is there? I do not have veto power. And a lot of people suggested for the first month, like the first round, because rounds actually last a few months. There's voting is a month long process and that's why it takes a month before it starts issuing. And those were, votes remain for a few months. It's not meant to be something that has constant political squabble. It is meant to be a funding mechanism and that has risks and that someone can get votes and then suddenly like, nope, I don't feel like it. And that is something we've discussed and we've discussed countermeasures and those countermeasures have not been effective or well-designed enough that I'd be willing to have them at launch. It's definitely something we can have in a network upgrade because I plan on doing those regularly. But a lot of people did suggest to me coding it so I am guaranteed to receive the first month, whether it be a percentage such as 50% or it be the whole 100%. I have this one friend who is someone I trust and they're definitely an advocate of decentralization. I'm not trying to say there's some Ripple fanboy. No, they very much hate Ripple. Um, but they, suggest, they said if they launched a currency, they would uh, pre-mine 20% of the total supply, not for themselves firstly, but for a development fund to ensure if any legal challenges come up to get developers to be able to do marketing to foster yeah. a community. And well, while I think that is excessive, I think even 10% is on the higher range. He said like he said like you should at least program the first month, the first round for yourself. And he did advocate 100% removing the democracy aspect entirely. It's not like... 50% of it is still up for that. And that would mean a lot to me, as in, I'm not just talking like, I, I don't mean community wise. If, uh, if the community trust, I, I don't think if I program it for myself, that's saying the community trusts me. If I program it for myself, that says the community is willing to go along with it because I'm the only developer. <laughs> I think if the community decides to reward me, that would mean a lot to me emotionally, but I still acknowledge that because of the name recognition I have, while the community is showing their trust in me and I appreciate that, there is also the question just, is there not someone they trust more? It's kind of like an election process. You yeah. may not like either candidate, but you'll still vote for one. Yeah. Um, so, but I will say that from beyond the social aspect, I, it would mean a lot to me financially. Again, Maros didn't have an ICO. We don't have a pre-mine. We don't have some corporation backing us. And these are all things I've done in the name of decentralization. And the way the Maros Development Fund is set up is also in the name of decentralization. But I've worked on this for a few years now, and I've been doing contracts on the side to stay afloat, and there's been a lot of doing. We never accepted donations. So because of that, I'm not going to lie and say, oh, yeah, no, I could go financially without it. And I will still contribute to Maris no matter what. But I will say that if I cannot – and this is just a fact of life. I'm not trying to pressure anything. This isn't a sob story. I don't have cancer. I'm not sending up a GoFundMe. But if I don't, I will have to continue doing contracts. I might look into part-time employment and – because that, that would limit the amount of time. Because while I am willing to, because I care about Maros and I've cared about it for this long and I'll continue to care about Maros, the point of this Maros development fund is to not only get people to work on the project in the first place, but to enable them to just work on the progress project, to focus on it, to spend a lot more of their time on it. And that's what it means to me besides the social aspect of I would be honored 
or that people trust me to that level. And then beyond me and you, there are another couple of community members who I can definitely cite as having contributed in a very meaningful manner. And I hope that a couple of people besides us also submit proposals. And between all of us, yeah, I might not end up getting 50%, but even just being the plurality would mean a lot to me. And if I'm not the plurality, if you're very, okay, I have to say this. I know we talked about this before the call, but if you're very shiny head, it is very shiny today. I just want to acknowledge that. You got your beard going. It's a very nice beard. You know, it's really growing in. It, it looks very good. But combined um, with the shiny head, if you might get the, you might get like 49%. I might get 40%. I, I have to say, I would totally respect that. I would give you that clap. I would, even if you got over 50%. <laughs> uh, you're very uh, personable. There's a reason okay. you're such a great host. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's hope that that's true. So I'm going to put my, my, uh, my proposal in for 80% yeah. of the Meros Development Fund. But and I'm going even to spend if I'm it not on uh, fried chicken. Happy. Uh, even if I'm not exceedingly happy with how it goes from a personal perspective, because, you know, I, I, I would like to get that money. That's not why I'm doing this. I'm obviously leaving this open to democracy and decentralization. If I really wanted that hash, I would add a 20% free mine, you know? Yeah. There is a reason I'm doing the Maris Development Fund. And even if I am slightly disappointed with any compensation I make for my years of work, I care more about uh, decentralization and the closest we have to a democratic process. Again, we're not doing KYC. We're not doing one person, one vote. We are waiting it by the amount of funds one has. But it's not master nodes and it's not time locked, thankfully, which I think definitely increases accessibility. And that is something I value more than any amount of funds that could be given to me. Okay, right. I'm uh, conscious of time as we've, we've gone over our half an hour um, I, plans. Actually, I always think our longest podcasts are best. Yes, I think all yeah. of them should be an hour. <laughs> Yes. We're at least then, 45 minutes. And this one has been an hour. So what and it I has been amazing. To, uh, what, uh, what it has actually, it's been one of the best. And it's been what the I'm, first podcast where I have been able to mention your shiny head. Because again, it is very shiny today. It looks great. I am very proud of you. <laughs> this is only maybe the third podcast we've had with video. So my shiny head has not been out very much. I've got a hat right here. Next week, I'm going to And that is why this Next is so month. significant. Next month, I'm going to wear a cap. Okay. So... Finally, um, two two last questions. First of all, let's do this one first. When will Meros launch? When will it launch, you said? Or was there a word in there? Sorry, you kind of... Yes, when will Meros launch? Sorry. Got it. It, it. It's just hard to hear you for a second. Just wanted to double check. <laughs> um, so one of the things I said is I wanted the code to be ready of the year. And that is something I stand by. Um... But I was hoping, hoping to launch the final test net at the start of December. And as we're recording this, it's the end of November, because we generally record this in the last week of the month before it goes live in the first week of next month. Um, and we're not discussing the final test net. We're describing one more test net before the final test net, which is something personally unfortunate. And I was hoping to do the final test net in December and therefore be ready to launch at the end of the year. But we were probably going to launch one to two weeks after just because of the holidays to ensure people have plenty of time. Because we could launch during the holidays, but I truly want the network to have a strong start, which means lots of participation. And I don't want someone to choose Christmas dinner or Barrows. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or just family time in general. With Corona, a lot of people have been just isolating and if they have the opportunity to get together with their family i and i truly hope they're taking preventions you know small groups wearing masks and i'm not saying you like if you're living with your family you, no obviously i'm just saying be reasonable you know if you're taking an airplane don't decide to go around licking all the seats um, well, you've got to remember but, that masks are not such a big uh topic around the world so in america it kind of is where masks are going oh, over yeah, no america is just just dealing with it much worse than other countries. So I'm speaking here as the American and the ignorant <laughs> American who's not considering other countries. I just wanted to say my, my focus isn't to distract from people spending time with their families. Yeah. I just also wanted to note that people should be healthy and responsible if they're doing that. Yeah. Um, as best as they can. So, so where, we, right. so where, so where do we land? Are, are we looking at the first few, few months of 2021? That you're oh, planning definitely. For? I am hoping and this is a bit later than I initially said, but I am hoping for the end of January. One of the delays has been, personally, I've just been distracted the past few weeks. I've just had some personal problems I don't want to get into too much, but that's been on me. And it's not something I'm happy with because of how it delays Maros. But there is some times where you have to say, I've done this much for the project. I really just need to take a step back, even though it's close to launch. Um, 
And then a few days ago, my family came and visited, and I wanted to spend time with them. And beyond that, there is a part of the protocol I had to update. Despite me saying there's no massive reforms, and there still isn't massive reforms, there hasn't been a while, there is one part of it I truly had to update just because it was poorly designed in hindsight. And it was just this, it was the penalty system we had. There was just an aspect of it I could have done better. And it really, one of the final things on my to-do list was to implement one last feature into the penalty system. And when I went to implement it, I realized the problems with expanding it and maintaining it had really reached a tipping point where I can't just fix it later. I did have to fix it at that moment. And because of that, that has added about another 10 days to development, which is also something I have been working on. But those factors have made me, unfortunately, want to push it back a few weeks. That said, we are planning on starting our next test net, not the final test net, which I want to run for a month, but another once I redo the penalties, or not redo, it's not, it's really more just updating it uh, with the longest time being spent with the most time of the most time actually just be setting on the design and making sure it's competent. But sorry, I just lost my train of thought for a second. <laughs> so but this next that... test net will be done after we update the penalty system. And I'm hoping for it to run for about a week and really get community participation and not only test the new functionality, but also stability. Because in the past our test nets have generally ended when a transaction is going around that causes every node to crash or when new nodes are unable to sync. I remember a last one, uh, nodes weren't able to sync more than a few days of blocks because a few days in the protocol, it, it updated the random X hash algorithm we use. Your, it, the protocol says updated every few days with a new aspect. It's officially recommended. It's not some custom weird thing we're doing. Mm-hmm. It says that you should update a uh, extra piece of it that is hashed with any regular data every couple of days. And because of that, when it updated, it did break syncing and that's something we had to update. And I actually got a fix for that within a couple, within just a few hours and deployed it. But after that, I decided, yeah, I really feel like we've logged all the bugs we can for this test net. I don't see a need to get everyone to update critically. And I just want to go back to development because doing running a test net does take up a lot of my time. So I do want to get one for another week for going for a week, which will be our longest one yet. But it's not going to be our final month-long test net, which I truly want to cover everything. Because as I said, I feel like anyone who launches any currency project, whether it be DeFi, a Bitcoin fork, does have a moral obligation to make sure that they're building a system that isn't going to leak funds. Whether that be via 80% free mine that they're about to dump and screw over their users with, whether it be an exploit, whether whatever it be. I do feel there is a moral obligation when dealing with currency to understand how it's going to be participated with. And the fact that some participants, you know, they're people. They're not just objects to give you money. They're people with lives. And some of these people may have a lot of difficulty with losing this money. Yeah. Okay. Um, If somebody wants to get involved with Meros, um, we're talking, um, obviously, this is not investment advice. So we're talking about actually getting involved in Mm -hmm. Meros. What sorts of things can they do and where should they go to, to find out more and to, to, to interact with you? So our Discord is always going to be the primary platform for communication. Um, but one of the things I've been trying to do, not well, not because, like it, not because I am bad at it. I just haven't spent a lot of time on it. One of the things I've been trying to do is increase our Twitter presence because we are very Discord focused. And that just means tweeting regularly, which isn't something the best at. But when we do tweet, I feel like it gains a lot of attention. So just tweets and like spreading the news, that would definitely be helpful if you want to just do a small contribution. Uh, If you're a developer and you think you contribute in that way, whether it be to the Cormeros code, whether it be to a light wallet, whether it be to a mobile app, that would be something I truly love to see. I know one developer has been reaching out to me interested if there's any work they could do. Um, And they're looking to work as a contractor, which is something I completely respect. We've hired contractors before. And I am thankfully in a position where I can bring on some outside help. Uh, But I'm not going to be able to offer any part-times, full-time jobs, 401ks. We are discussing smaller contracts. Mm -hmm. That said, there is one I wanted to announce, which I'll have the full details up in a few days, like an actual requirement sheet. And it is probably going to be a bounty where multiple people can apply, and I'm actually interested to see the variations. But Meros, uh, something really important to me is that it has a block explorer at launch, but that's also something that takes a couple of weeks to do right, even just for a prototype. And because of that, I do believe I'm going to be creating a bounty 
likely with prizes. So anyone who participates is going to, you know, be thankful and I'll see if I can, depending, if we get 50 people, I'm not going to give each of them a small amount of money, but if we get five people, I'll probably send thank you gifts to everyone. Uh, and then we'll probably look at a first and second place, you know, like, I really appreciate the opportunities we have here. These are definitely block explorers we can use and really encourage uh, competition to see who can does, do the best one just because that's going to give Maris the best one. So that is something I'm very, uh, I am plan on announce within the next week or so if this going live. And I think it's going to be very exciting to see what people come up with. Awesome. Awesome. Right. Hi, Abba. Thank you very, very much for your time. As ever, you've been a, a, a joy to interview. Um, before I let you go, because I know there's plenty of things you want to do with your... Uh, oh, actually, I'm not going to say what that is. But I know there's plenty of other things you want to do with your life besides being stuck here with me. Is there anything you want to say to the um, about Meros that we have, haven't covered? Or is there any, any messages you want to get out to the people besides... Um, the fact that there's going to be a explorer competition soon is there anything else you want to talk about uh block explorer test net coming up soon not the final one but definitely a quality test net and then releases upcoming but i truly think it was just great to provide one podcast that kind of summarizes the past couple of years not only for the two-year anniversary of this podcast technically last month we covered that but also <laughs> as we approach mainnet i really do think that this is going to be a great way to explain the project in detail without asking them to watch 24 hours or 12 <laughs> hours because some are half an hour but some are it, it may the, the, the total runtime of our series may be 18 hours or so so yeah. it is going to be great to provide a more concise look even if this is hour hour and a half <laughs> yeah well I, I what i'm gonna try and do is um cut down some segments so there might be some two minute segments wow. like where you yeah where you become quite concise about different parts i don't listen mate i'm I'm getting up there as far as I would just recommend you do a full unedited version and then yeah. you do a 10 minutes highlight reel. You know, question and then the best slices no, of the no, answer. No, no, no. What I was going to go for was some small one or two minute highlights so that I can post them to places like Instagram and Twitter. So, oh, okay. yeah, I, so I definitely recommend that. That sounds like a great idea. Like, yeah, people can get it like fast food. That's what I'm going to do. Not the Instagram okay. part. I'm not personally a fan of Instagram, but definitely the Twitter one. Yeah, well, it's not for you. You don't need the highlights because you already know all this stuff, don't you? I, I enjoy you, like watching your content. You're you're a very you're a very talented host. Oh, thank you. Thank and you. now that there's video, we get to appreciate your beard. Oh, oh, I know. I've been working on this. Okay, right. So, thank you very much. Oh, for those for those of you who have been listening or watching, because obviously this is still going out as audio only, so they're not going to get to appreciate my beard nor yours, which is quite magnificent. Also, I must say. Thank you. Um, congratulations on reaching the end. You've done extra well this time because this is probably the longest episode we've ever done. I'm going to go and say it is the longest episode we've ever done. Mm -hmm. So well done for that. Please make sure that you like and subscribe and all that other good stuff. But now we're getting to the point where Miros is close to launching. So this is a time where you should start sharing. So also, if you can share it, do share it. Obviously, don't overly shill it. Don't ram it down people's throats. Um, don't spread yeah. misinformation. Don't. don't spread misinformation, yes. Don't, don't say a thousand TPS at launch. <laughs> <laughs> don't. Definitely don't do that, okay? Um, so, yeah, I've been Cryptosi. Uh, this has been Kaya Bar. I want to point the right way this time. So, yeah, thank you very much, Kaya Bar. And uh, thank you for those who have listened and watched. And we will catch you again in 2021 possibly after oh actually before i go let me just clarify the next test net will be a developer's test net and then the final month long test net will be a test net for everybody is that about right uh yes this next one is going to be a developer's test net which means you have to compile it yourself but the next one we're actually going to have downloads available and i even hope to have the gui ready so people can be friendlier and experiencing it it don't have to be don't have to use the terminal at all they can just double click the icon on their desktop and you know and start oh, finding out right okay yeah so those are the those are the two things i wanted to just clarify so yeah developers test ne next time which is um, not really that interesting to people who are not developers and then after that the the proper the proper the uh proper test net for everybody else and then main net launch so kaiba thank you very much thank you to everybody for listening and watching and we will see you in 2021 fingers crossed thank you very much and goodbye <laughs>